Welcome to another session of Lectures by Lobizi. I'm your host, Dr. Lobizi. Today we'll be talking about the Congress of Vienna. Okay, so the Congress of Vienna takes place on the heels of the French Revolution. Okay, let me move. Actually, let me move my head out of the way. How's that? Go up here. So the Congress of Vienna uh, was a uh, organ was a meeting that was held uh, in an attempt to try to bring lasting uh, peace uh, to Europe, continental Europe. Uh, and so, uh, due to the size and scope of the Napoleonic Wars, the 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 cost of the war, both in uh, money and in human terms, as far as losses, casualties, etc. Uh, there was a real desire among the countries of Europe to get it right. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, try to restore peace and order, okay, uh, to France. And the uh, members uh, that were responsible for bringing down Napoleon, that is the coalition, uh, Russia, Prussia, Austria, Great Britain, they're going to be the key decision makers at the Congress of Vienna, um, where this, you know, peace conference is going to take place. And um, <clears throat> they're not only skeptical of the violence that was caused uh, by the Napoleonic Wars, they're also concerned about what happened before, and that is the French Revolution. Okay, and so uh, there was a, you know, the. It, if you talk about the themes or the slogan of the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, these are new forces. And um, they're viewed with skepticism by the diplomats because of all the violence associated with the French Revolution. So, you know, it wasn't a, a, like that they're necessarily against, you know, liberty and equality. It's, it's that they're associated with the French Revolution. And that was, um, you know, a... Uh, very violent um, age or time period. So they're going to view that with skepticism, okay? Uh, as I said, the four countries, Russia, Prussia, Austria, and Great Britain, they're going to be the <laughs> main decision makers. Move my head again uh, there. But this man, Clemens von Metternich, the Austrian foreign minister, he's really going to be sort of the architect, the person who shaped a lot of the... Um, the things, the decisions that are made at the uh, Congress of Vienna, okay? So um, another term should be used to describe Clemens von Metternich, and we'll discuss it in a later video, but that term is, cons he's a conservative, okay? Uh, and so he and, you know, tr typically it's those people who were previously in charge, the ruling elite. Those are the people that are going to be sort of classified as... Uh, uh, conservatives and just to kind of you know tip my hand a little bit about what that is is they they are pretty interested in maintaining the status quo okay meaning they don't want to see a lot of uh, changes take place and they they like the traditional hierarchy uh, because of the order that it provided and they like the idea of uh, traditions and um, authority and the past and they really appreciate the wisdom of the ages, okay? And so all these newfangled ideas that uh, were br brought to the world uh, or birthed uh, by the French Revolution, uh, yeah, they're not, they don't favor it. They're, they're not feeling it, okay? So right down here it says, one of the things that uh, Clemens von Metternich said for lasting peace in order to be established in Europe uh What's necessary for that to take place is legitimacy, uh, balance of power, and containment. Okay, so let's talk about uh, legitimacy, balance of power, and containment. And what those, you know, w what they mean, and uh, what w what that kind of represented for the rest of Europe. Okay, so legitimacy is the best way to restore order uh, through making sure that the appropriate heads of state uh, are in charge. Okay that they're restored to power because the Napoleonic Wars toppled a lot of um, countries and uh, we see a lot of monarchs that were toppled. And so if you don't have government, you're going to have anarchy. So it makes sense to restore, you know, some form of government to all of these countries that were toppled because once 
Napoleon's removed, it's like, who's going to govern now, right? So that was really important. But because these men are conservatives, they're going to want to make sure that it's the traditional authority that's uh, restored. And, and they, they start off with first France and uh, they can't dig up Louis the 16th because he's been, um, you know, guillotined. So they're going to bring out his brother and that's going to be Louis the 18th. Okay. And that's who's pictured uh, in that uh, portrait right there. Okay. So the next is balance of power, <clears throat> and the and the thinking here is that countries typically don't uh, attack their neighbors unless they think that they can win. And if that's the case, when you look at the map of Europe, what you notice is there's some big countries and there's some small countries. Okay, so on both little bookends, on the western edge you have France, which is a big powerful country, and then Russia is a, a large country as well. Uh, and in the middle, you know, what used to be the Holy Roman Empire, you got a collection of a variety of different Germanic states, okay? And so w what they thought um, these little countries did was invite trouble. And so if you want to have lasting peace, then there has to be a way for there to be larger countries, okay? You don't want to take land away from France or Russia because that obviously would trigger some type of conflict. So this is all about maintaining peace. So in order to do that, they decided to add territory to both Russia, excuse me, both Prussia, okay, that's the large uh, growing Germanic state right here, and then Austria, okay. So they took some territories, Westphalia and Saxony, and gave that over to Prussia. And they took some Italian uh, regions, uh, Lombardy and v Venetia, and gave that over to Austria. All right. Well, just so we're clear, um, that means, at least for those four uh, kingdoms that I mentioned, uh, legitimacy wasn't going to be honored. Okay, so that means that that's less important than um, balance of power. The balance of power is more important, okay? And so those four territories, uh, Westphalia, Saxony, Lombardy, and Venetia, they did not get uh, their rightful kings back because they were absorbed uh, by uh, Prussia and Austria, okay? Uh, but <clears throat> the overall uh, document, uh, the Congress of Vienna, was successful in establishing uh, peace throughout Europe for uh, a period of close to 40 years. So in in, in some ways, uh, it was successful, okay? In other ways, it wasn't. And uh, before we finish, I'll discuss that. The third thing uh, that the Congress of Vienna did was address was containment. And so when, when we say containment, we mean uh, sort of boxing France in, making sure that France's neighbors are strengthened okay because it's kind of like a a lion uh, and a lamb you, you're you're not you shouldn't be surprised if you put a, a little baby lamb uh, next to a hungry lion you shouldn't be surprised if the lion eats the lamb and so that's kind of the thinking there that with a big powerful uh, France it, it's not a good idea to put a bunch of small vulnerable countries next to it as its neighbors and so they decided uh, to address this containment in two ways. Okay, so they took uh, Belgium uh, and the Dutch Republic and they sort of sandwiched them together, okay, and created the Netherlands right here. Okay, so two small countries being joined together to make sort of a medium-sized country that, you know, thinking was that, that would make them a little less um, vulnerable, okay? Um and then uh, all of these Germanic kingdoms uh, that, like I said before, were once part of um, the Holy Roman Empire, you know, like what's going to happen to them? Because the Holy Roman Empire no longer exists. That was destroyed by uh, Napoleon. So the decision was made not to create a unified state, but the next best thing, and that was to create a defensive alliance, okay? And so the Ger German Confederation or the Germanic Confederation is born. So you have a collection of 38 Germanic states, including both Prussia and Austria, because they're Germanic. And the idea is that if uh, France were to attack any of them, 
it would be like an attack against all of them. And then so they were then therefore obligated uh, to defend each other against France. Okay, so that's the Germanic uh, Confederation. So <clears throat> the decision uh, to punish or to not punish France was debated during the Congress of uh, Vienna. Initially, most people voted for leniency, but then in the middle of the conference, Napoleon uh, escaped his uh, island exile from Elba and returned to power for that 100-day period. Uh, and the French embraced him. They didn't turn him over to the authorities. And so once he was defeated once again and exiled um, to St. Helena, he the, or the uh, Congress of Vienna sort of reconvened. And this time, they weren't quite as lenient. They um, made France pay a, uh, I don't know, substan a fairly substantial uh, war indemnity or war reparations, about 700 million francs. Um, but they didn't take any territory uh, from France, okay? This little picture here is what France was at during um, its height under Napoleon, okay? And these are, you know, greatly uh, advanced uh, borders, okay? All the way to the Rhine River. That's not France's traditional boundaries. So all they did was they just kind of rolled it back a little bit to where France used to be, okay? So they didn't take any anything away from them. And the thinking is that to do so would be misguided because it would leave the French resentful and they would want revenge and that could lead to future conflict. Okay. So that, that was a pretty wise decision. Um, I talked about uh, this in class to students that, you know, 103 years later at the uh, close of world war one, when they had the Paris peace conference, they did not, uh, the diplomats there did not listen or, you know, remember the lesson of um, the Congress of Vienna because they harshly punished uh, Germany. And a lot of historians think that that's a large reason why there was World War II was because of how, um, you know, harshly uh, Germany was uh, punished at the end of World War I. Okay. And, uh, okay, so we've got that three ingredient list for how to create lasting peace. You've got uh, legitimacy, balance of power, and containment. So what if, despite our best efforts, war uh, breaks out? Well, what else can be done? So this is really a novel idea. The four countries, uh, Russia, Prussia, uh, Austria, and Great Britain, decided that they would create a international... Um, organization known as the Concert of Europe. And this organization's number one focus is going to be maintain peace um, and prevent war, okay? And they decide that they're going to meet from time to time uh, and discuss any type of issues that might be popping up and see what, if any, actions need to be taken, okay? I should say this like quadruple alliance will uh, eventually become the quintuple alliance when France is allowed to rejoin. So once France sort of proves or demonstrates that they're, you know, being a good boy, they get uh, invited back into this, uh, um, you know, international organization. And so, yeah, they have two tools that they're going to utilize to try to maintain peace. One is collective security. And then the other is principle of intervention. So collective security is just if there is a country somewhere uh, in Europe that decides that they're going to attack, sort of preemptively attack their neighbors uh, in an aggressive war, then collective se security would be used to maintain peace, to prevent conflict. You know, either they're going to help solve whatever the grievance is kind of mediate between the two sides, the two countries, or if force is going to be used that they're going to threaten, you know, like give an ultimatum to the aggressor nation. Hey, if you attack, we will uh, defend this other country. We will, um, 
use force to stop you, okay? And the logic there is that they'll back down, right? So that makes sense. And then uh, the next is the principle of intervention, which simply is if a country is struggling with internal unrest, okay? There's something that's bubbling up that is has triggered like uh, an uprising or a full-on revolution then if the monarch of that particular country where the revolution is going on if their if their power is being threatened like they can't control it they can't manage this unrest then the other countries uh would come in with force and put down the rebellion okay now that the principle of intervention was necessary quite often. And uh, the reason being is because people sort of got a taste of liberty. They got a taste for equality. Uh, first with the French Revolution and then with Napoleon. When Napoleon conquered a lot of places, he brought the Napo Napoleonic Code and there was equality before the law and, you know, some liberties that the people had not not a ton but they had some and you know at least early on it wasn't very authoritarian and uh so people kind of liked that and then all that stuff was taken away from them and that's kind of like uh, the example i use is trying to put a genie back in a lamp again uh, you know it's hard to unroll that stuff like to take away liberty and equality and then expect the people to be okay with that and so uh, there's lots of uprising and there's lots of need for principle of intervention and that it, it's all due to, you know, the, the response to people's unhappiness over losing their um, liberty and equality. OK, uh, <clears throat> there's also some nationalistic uh, uprisings, too, but we'll discuss that in a later uh, video. But I think that's pretty much all I needed uh, to discuss. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. All right. Uh, thanks a lot.